O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We've already embarked on the journey of Great Lent, and it might be helpful to take a step back and to take a bird's eye view of where we've come and where we're headed. To this point, we remembered the humility of the publican and the return of the prodigal, we recalled the day of judgment and the preeminence of love. And in the weeks ahead, our journey will pass through a series of spiritual landscapes, all centered on the way of the cross. So, how exactly does this first Sunday of Lent fit into the picture? How is a celebration of orthodoxy associated with the context of brokenness? and healing, of repentance and forgiveness. We have the historical background of the 8th and 9th centuries. We have the theological basis of icons in the doctrine of incarnation. And of course, we have the inspirational art of a Theophanes and a Rubyov, of an Uspensky and a Kontoglu. But in many churches and parts of the world this day, will also be charged with a sense of triumphalism, of heresy hunting. There will be commemoration of Byzantine anathemas, there will be censure of religious leaders, and there will be condemnation of those whom, well, we just don't like, either because we assume to know the boundaries of doctrine and morality, or because we presume to be the defenders of tradition. How does that reflect or respect the spirit of Lent? There is undoubtedly a seductive thrill in scouring for dissidents. We look for them outside the church, we look for them inside the church. For some, reducing this day to a celebration of heroes and condemnation of heretics ensures a smug feeling of security or guiltlessness. Yet I would suggest that the Lenten disposition, at least as expressed in the prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian, discourages both the spirit of slander and the sin of pride. After all, in the current state of Orthodox Christianity, we probably don't need a separate feast to entertain conceit about our orthodoxy or to indulge judgmentally in the heterodoxy of others. So let's be iconoclasts, just for a moment. There will be processions of icons today, in person around churches, or at home by virtual attendance. After all, this is a celebration, it is a jubilation. But there is a paradoxical mystery here, because the icon is silent. When we enter a church or stand in prayer at home, the single most resonant and the most conspicuous setting that we encounter is the omnipresent tranquility of icons, a soundless declaration of the reality and realization that the kingdom of God is among us and within us. And here's the contradiction. For century after century, the church lived with icons, but it never talked about them. For the better part of two millennia, the church prayed with icons, but it never preached about them. Even in periods of persecution, when believers attributed the very survival of their faith to icons, people never ascribed any metaphysical dimension to them. If we read the classical patristic sources on icons, St. John of Damascus in the 8th century, St. Theodore the Studite in the 9th century, we discover an emphasis on the divine incarnation, that matter mattered because the Creator became created, which means that the whole world, every living person and every breathing thing, reflects 
the face of God. But no quaint emphasis on icons as windows to heaven or manifestations of beauty, no artificial distinction between painting or writing icons. Even in the golden ages of iconography, whether the early schools of Crete and Russia or the subsequent styles of Serbia and Romania, the priority was not on what the icon communicates. For centuries, icons were surrounded by spiritual reflection and shrouded by theological silence. Only very recently was the icon somehow born again as some exotic hallmark to recruit proselytes to orthodox spirituality and mysticism. So the first point I would like to underline is that silence is the quintessence of the icon. The icon is actually empty. It's not a thing in and of itself. It is open, open-ended. Despite its superb presence and eloquence, the icon is above all a paragon of supreme stillness. But of course, it speaks volumes. The emptiness and worldlessness of the icon connects us with a depicted reality, a saintly person or a miraculous moment that reflects and suggests the living God. So, if the icon were to speak, what would it say? In a word, it would say that God created the whole world and it was good. Beautiful is the word used in Genesis. It would say that God so loved the world that he assumed the world. There's no doubt that everything we see and say, everything we do and touch, is tainted by the fall, marred by sin. But the icon bears witness to the transparent goodness, the transcendent beauty of the whole world, of you and me. It symbolizes, it stands as proof of the overriding goodness, the overwhelming beauty of all things, and all people. Everyone and everything are condensed and contained in the wood of an icon as in the chalice of communion. In a word, the icon is a sacrament. Shouldn't it say and mean something that when we gaze at them, icons make us feel comforted, less isolated, not judged, they allow us to stand before them, to be with them without any pronouncement of sentence or any hint of segregation or any suppression of shame. That's what it means to be in a church with icons. It means we are welcome, accepted, appreciated, not taken for granted, not abandoned, not guilt-ridden. Because the church isn't or shouldn't be like other institutions. It doesn't or shouldn't resemble a political party, for instance, where you are censured if you question the party line or take risks. In the church, there is room for failure and mistakes, for aberration and transgression. In the church, there is room for inclusiveness and forgiveness. In fact, in the church, if you pass judgment, you are more likely to be misjudging. You're more likely to be imposing yourself on others, denouncing them on the basis of your skewed or narrow definition of orthodoxy or morality. Whereas, if you see in your brother and sister what Christ saw in every sinner, the face of the Creator, the image of the Redeemer, the mark of the Comforter, then you are far more likely to approach with reverence, to stand with respect, to behave with resignation, just as you do before an icon. Deep down, but far deeper than we often look, 
is the divine image that survives and even thrives triumphantly when we surrender our self-righteousness. That's the triumph of orthodoxy. That's the celebration of iconography, not condemning the error of some, but discerning the transparency of all. It's about perceiving others as more susceptible to God's grace and more open to God's presence. It's about permitting God's light to shine more brightly and God's life to flow more freely inside us and around us. That's the invitation of the first Sunday of Lent. That's the vocation of every Christian. And by the way, that's why we process with icons, because they are what we want to become. It's as if on this one day of the year, we remove icons from the iconostasis, hold them close to our heart, carrying them into the streets and inside our churches or homes. And then, as icons, yearning at all times for restoration, we set out on the road to that night of resurrection that shines more brightly than any darkness in ourselves and in our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.